actually remember the uh, movie Down With Love? I was originally thinking, okay, so they're cool with love. I don't get it. But anyway. So, <laughs> all right. So, yeah. So the idea of this talk is Down With Morphemes with the, uh, with the idea of what word and paradigm, I'm going to use this, what word and paradigm morphology can teach us about language creation. All right, and the purposes of this talk will be threefold. The first is going to be to introduce uh, and explain two competing theories of morphology that are out there right now. Uh, second, to um, illustrate the consequences each theory has on constructing a naturalistic timeline. So I don't have anything to say about angelines or oxlines per se. And also to show specifically how word and paradigm morphology can aid the construction of a naturalistic language. All right, I have an outline, so you'll know where we are. I think this will be good. All right, so what we want to start with then is ask ourselves the question, for some of us that haven't had a bunch of linguistics classes, uh, what's morphology, essentially? Traditionally, the term morphology refers to the study of morphemes, which leads to the question, what's uh, morpheme? All right, first of all, I wanted to point out, uh, I forget what pages my handouts are, my handouts on, but I have all the slides. Yeah, those ones. I have all the slides on there. Second, if you see anywhere in here a term that's highlighted in orange, I'll have a definition for it in the back. So I won't be giving definitions during the talk, but you can take a look at it for those who don't, aren't familiar with them, or for linguists who want to check my work and grade me afterwards. All right. <laughs> so back to our question. So now we're, we're at what is morphing? Uh, traditionally, what a morpheme is, is a piece of phonological information that has a conventionalized meaning uh, arbitrarily associated with it. And so let's, let me show you an example. Ha, ah, here we go. So here we have two English words. The first is cat, and it has, in theory, two meanings associated with it. The first is the idea of cathood. So four legs, tail, and fur, but then if the cat has three legs, it's still a cat. And then, <laughs> yes. and, uh, and uh, oh, whoops. Is a point of, and the idea that there's only one of them. And cats has two, two meanings associated with it, and the only difference is that there's more than one of them, two or more, since this is English. Therefore, what you have with the idea of morphine is that if with two bits of meaning and two uh, pieces of phonological information, you have uh, this base cat, the uh, meaning is directly associated with these arbitrary sound systems. So we have cat equals the meaning cat, and this equals plural, or more than one. All right. So this is the idea of what a morpheme is. Morphemes are derived, in, are, come in two types. So we have free and bound morphemes. So uh, morphemes that can occur on their own, essentially, are free morphemes, and those that can't are known as uh, bound morphemes, for example, affixes. So in our example, cat is a free morpheme because you can use it, just the sound cat by itself in its sentence, as a noun, for example, like. I like cats, you like dog, I don't know, sorry. Uh, but, and then um, you can add um, S to it and say, you know, cats are cool, but you can't say, for example, S is cool, means um, some sort of plural entity is cool. So that's what we mean. How about just plurality? <laughs> plurality is cool. S is <laughs> so, so then that should be our new rally. <laughs> Which is a 
verb, and if you add this er to it, suddenly you get a noun, which means speaker. And so though the suffix itself has the same form, er, and it does the same things phonologically to words it's attached to, it actually is performing two different functions, which I'll now explain. Uh, the er that changes wicked to wicked er is what's known as the inflectional, or one of the bits of the inflectional morphology of English. So what inflectional morphology does is it, uh, and this is, this is, a, this is a, a basic explanation, is it deals with changes to a word that don't affect its lexical category, whether it's a noun, an adjective, or a verb. But to get a pro, uh, I don't know what word I wanted there, um, but typically that's it. Uh, it affects other types of things. For example, changing a noun from singular to plural or another language to dual, case on nouns, so like uh, he, him, things like that and uh, tense on verbs. These are the types of things that are typically thrown into the inflectional uh, realm of things. The other er is a part of what's known as English's derivational morphology. And uh, what this guy does is it, uh, it changes essentially one lexeme to another. So um, for example, we have uh, speak, right? And you add the er and you get speaker. It changes a verb which is, does a particular type of thing and takes a particular type of inflection or morphology, like he speaks, we speak. And it changes it to a completely different category, in this case a noun, which takes its own inflection or morphology, and changes its meaning so that it derives it in a uh, hopefully, maybe, or not, systematic, somewhat sort of way. So those are, the, those are the two ideas behind the two bits. And so the traditional view of morphology presented uh, thus far about uh, you know inflectional and derivational and the whole bit is uh, commonly referred to by some in some traditions as item and arrangement morphology. Uh, this is an old term that's been around for a long time, and there are various theories that are more instantiations of this. Uh, the basic idea behind IA is that meaning is achieved is achieved by stringing morphemes, which are you know <coughs> bits of meaning that are associated or little bits of sound that are associated with meaning together. You combine the sounds to get a phonological word. You combine the meanings to get a meaningful word. So here we have the word inescapability. And the idea is that this is actually a morphologically interesting word if you think about if something is escapable or not. But you add in, which would mean something like opposite, escape, which would mean to escape, bubble, able to do X, and itty, the uh, nounimus thereof, or something. <laughs> and so, you get the word inescapability, and you kind of like build it up like Legos. All right. So this is IA morphology. And the question that uh, I want to ask is, um, is language really this simple? So bullet point two are uh, problems with this view of language. OK, for the time being, let's assume that language is this simple. That is. Meaning in language is nothing more than the combination of meaningful bits, these morphemes, and the meanings associated with those bits. Combine them, you get your word, and you get your sentence, and so forth. Uh, first, there are some theoretical, right. First, there are some theoretical problems. So here's, here's one. Here we have, and some people might have different plurals here, but you have fish, which is associated with fish and singular. And then you have fish, which is associated with fish and plural. And I, this is actually a plural for me. I say, if I look at a bowl of fish, I say, there are like five fish in there. I don't go around saying, man, look at those five fishes. No, that doesn't work with me. Some people do. And some people command bowl. It's kind of a fun category. But anyway, so uh, uh, the question is, that we want to ask ourselves is, where is the plural morpheme? And so the two things, they, they look darn similar, but they mean different things. We know they mean different things because they're used in different contexts. So where is the plural morpheme? Uh, the traditional um, kind of solution has been that fish plural looks like this. So we have fish plus a suffix which you can't see or hear, and that <laughs> suffix means uh, plural. So, um, so that being ironic, the cry is. Is cool. cool. You just have to pause for the writing now. You have to you have to look up how long you have to pause for each one more week. So the idea is, one question is, how do we know it's a suffix, first of all, because we can't see or hear it? Now, you know, plural, the plural suffix in English is typically a suffix, and even uh, irregular plurals like children, there's a rin suffix on it as well as vowel changing stuff. So if it really was something that wasn't there that was there, you might guess it was a suffix, but we really don't have any evidence to suggest as much. It may as well be a prefix. Another idea is if you look at these guys, 
and you think, okay, there's two meanings associated with fish plural, fish and plural. There's also two meanings associated with fish singular. Is there also an invisible suffix on fish that denotes singular? And also, is there an invisible suffix on every singular noun of English or any language that's like this that also means singular? And then if you add cases into it, are there invisible case markers for nominative and things like this? Well, it, it gets fun. So anyway, that's one theoretical problem. Over here. Uh, there, are also, there are also further theoretical problems. This is something that Hockett pointed out. There, so you have, uh, in English, we have take, you know, I, uh, we take linguistics, but if we don't do it anymore, then we took linguistics in the class, we don't take it. But uh, kids sometimes say that, for uh, reasonable reasons. But anyway, so the question is, how do you add something to take, to change, to cause its vowel to change? Um, Hockett proposed five morphine-based um, and now, uh, ways to do this, but I'll only give you one. One that I've seen is where you add a, an invisible suffix to take, and this type of suffix causes a change such that the vowel A changes to U. But again, we're stuck with the problem of is it a prefix or a suffix, and also, my goodness, what a powerful invisible suffix. <laughs> <laughs> and second, if we, if we have the invisible suffix for fish plural, and then we have this invisible suffix, and then we have two different types of invisible suffixes, which presumably will have to be added to the correct words, otherwise you go from fish to push. Passive, incoative, 
Okay. Yeah, I'm assumed to be, that means you're about to be whatever the noun is. Relative by marriage, call as Esperanto, masculine, negative, direct opposite, which was different from the negative. Or uh, wrongly, meaning you wrongly did it. Outward movement, movement below, inward movement above, movement dispersal. And ancient, something that's really, really old. Uh, <laughs> and inceptive, uh, let's see what else we got. Oh yeah, <laughs> to use objects, uh, worthy of X, container, small, part collective. Clear of the short, and there are actually many, many more. <laughs> and if you open up the, uh, the Word document that I have for this language and you look at it, it kind of is a list like that. Here are the morphemes, they're in some sort of order, but I now can't figure out what exactly the logic was. It might have even been alphabetical. But uh, <laughs> so um, when we're when we're doing a, a naturalistic language, when that's the goal, there are two main problems with this type of uh, language creation. The first is that the result is completely unnatural, and then by that I mean you know naturally occurring language actually does all inflection and derivation purely with affixes. Um, even Turkish, I have some very sketchy evidence from modern Turkish from a source that I can't quote because it's not even published yet and I don't know the name and it was just handed to me on a handout for the second party that even Turkish is doing some crazy stuff now that's non-Turkish life. So, yeah. <laughs> and the second one, and this was, this was my problem, the language is absolutely indestructible. So, um, if you come across a problem, and this especially happens when you're translating something, all you have to do is create a new morpheme, whether that be an affix or a new uh, lexeme, to solve your problem. So, for example, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Um, I started translating into Meg Davies Shakespeare's The Tempest. And uh, you know, I was just going right along. And, for example, there was a post on Conling. If you want to go look and embarrass me to my older posts, which are humiliating, you can see I actually posted on Conling, what does the word boat swing mean? This is from the, uh, you know, the introductory scene with the boat crash. And when I found out what boat swing mean, then I created my word for boat swing, and I proceeded. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I, I got pretty far away on that. But anyway, so there's no problem you can't tackle by just creating something new, some actual new piece of phonological information, or some just sort of default, kind of like the, uh, I don't want to pick any fights, but the uh, yay preposition of Esperanto, I think it's yay, or just kind of means this means anything you want. But if you want to be good with Esperanto, then use it. Um, anyway. So the question is, what's the alternative? The alternative! Ta-da! All right. Enter word and paradigm morphology. First, I want to um, say something about word and paradigm morphology, the term itself. It's kind of an, um, an umbrella term that refers to several different people that have done what are referred to as lexicalist theories of morphology. And so, let's see, I got a bunch of people, I don't want to leave anybody out, because they're all here and listening, and I'm sure they all want to see this. Uh, Stephen Anderson, Mark Aronoff, uh, Harry Bachner, the hero, uh, Joan Bybee, Farrell Ackerman down at UCSD, Gregory Stump, Peter Matthews, and Andrew Spencer, who I mistakenly left off of my reference pages. I'm sure you'll get an addictive email from me when he sees this. Um, <laughs> anyway, they all do different things, and some of them actually, if you look at them, are kind of notational variants of item and arrangement morphology, though they, would, they wouldn't admit to it. And I think they would be embarrassed if somebody tried to point them out to them. Either that or angry. But um, anyway, word and paradigm morphology is fundamentally different from item and arrangement morphology in these ways. Uh, first of all, is that the idea, the notion of a morphing does not exist at all. It's, uh, in fact, any time that somebody's uh, driven to use the word morphing, they actually use the word morphone, which was something that I think, I think it was Anderson that created the word. I don't know who created it. But it exists, it's out there now. It means something that's like a suffix, but it ain't no morphine. It's, <laughs> it's an adorable word, and I was hoping to get through this presentation without saying it once, so I'm sorry for confusing anybody. Don't talk about this if you're taking an undergraduate in the linguistics class. It's morphine, not morphine. Anyway, um, so yeah, morphemes don't exist. So what I mean by this is in uh, the word cats, for example, S doesn't mean plural. It's a suffix, yes, it's, some, it's a bit of phonological material that's added to the base cat, and it has some phonology that goes on between it. But it doesn't actually mean plural. Rather, the cats mean, the, the word cats means more than one cat. And that's it, and that's where you stop. Um, second, um, and yeah, I hope I got the definition of lexicon right there. Whole word forms are stored in the lexicon. So that means that there's an idea in item arrangement morphology that if there's a lexicon, there's a debate about that in varying instantiations of IA. 
The, all the morphemes will be listed in the lexi lexicon. So what you'll have is cat, you'll also have morpheme S. And cat will mean cat, S will mean plural. What you would have in this uh, type of theory is cat would be in the lexicon, and cats would also be in the lexicon. And they would be arranged into paradigms. So for example, in English, every noun will have in its paradigm, I don't know, a singular, plural, perhaps genitive, and they'll probably look very similar, and then genitive, singular, gender, plural, you know, the apostrophe S on there or something. And they will all be in there as, you know, cat, cats, cats, catses. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And there will be and there will be nominal paradigms and verbal paradigms. For example, in case languages, the paradigms will look much bigger with you know singular and plural noun cases. And with verbal paradigms, you'll have lots more morphology than you have with English, where it's just like uh, speaks, speaking, spoke, and spoken for a regular. And finally, um, and I apologize, this is a term I'm using just for this uh, presentation, the parameters of a given paradigm are language specific. And what I mean by that, in English, the only things that are meaningful as far as number goes is singular and plural. If you look at a language like, I don't know, um, tundra nenets, then singular dual and plural mean something specific because words are inflected for number, whether there's one of them, two of them, or more than two of them. For English, that doesn't mean anything morphologically special. You want to say two somethings, you say two, and then the plural. So anyway, that's part of where the uh, where the creative part comes in. So a question: What's a WP analysis look like? All right, here is a partial conjugation of a regular Spanish verb, and this is done in IPA. I decided to do the whole thing in IPA. So this is the verb to so. If I want to say I so, I say coso. If I want to say we so, cosemos. He or she or it so, cose, uh, they so, cosen, or you plural so if, uh, if you're from Mexico, like me. Woo! Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's what a regular verb looks like. And you can probably kind of glom off some suffixes there. O means that paradigm, A means that paradigm, A means and A, like that. And then this is what a partial conjugation, the same partial conjugation for an irregular Spanish verb that's somewhat similar sounding is. This is conocer, to know, uh, to know a person. And uh, if you'll notice, the suffixes are the same. So, conoce, conoce, conocemos. But in the first person plural, you have this K popping up out of nowhere. Conozco. Very bad to say conozco. That just, <coughs> it sounds terrible to my ear. Anyway, so, in analyzing these forms, we can note two patterns, essentially. The first pattern, which is the regular pattern. So, you know, you have your O suffix, M, O, S, A, N. And then the second pattern, which is the irregular pattern, it looks pretty much the same except that you have this K intruding on the first person singular paradigm. Right. Right. And, uh, hmm. this news to me. All right, yeah. And so the difference between, yeah, so essentially the difference between the two is the presence or absence of this K in the first person singular cell. Um, in order to capture these generalizations uh, without listing the morphemes, what I want to use is something called uh, Harry Bochner's Lexical Relatedness Morphology. This is a theory that he created in his dissertation that came out in 1993 that uh, afterwards was pretty much summarily ignored, even by morphologists. And uh, then he left the field of linguistics and is now happily doing something non-linguistic-y. And so this theory is almost lost, but they're trying to revive it down at UCSD, and I commend them for it. Anyway, in uh, lexical relatedness morphology, a word form, so remember cat, cats, the whole word form, is associated with other word forms in a given paradigm such that one can be used to predict the other. And this is exactly what it would look like. So here is a, an example of the Spanish, and I'll try to explain what this formalism is. I want to back up, but I won't. Okay. Um, so here we have the two paradigms. This is going to be the regular paradigm. This is going to be the irregular paradigm. What these curly brackets mean, this is just a partial, yeah, this is just an example of a partial conjugation, is that all of these forms in here go together. So this whole thing is the regular paradigm. Within are supposed to be uh, square brackets, and this is going to tell you how to fill a paradigm cell. X is a variable. It says that uh, you can input some other verb. And that's, this tells you what goes in here. The phonological material from some verb, and it will end in O. It will have some meaning. So for example, if this were um, so, it would be coso up here, and this would be so. And would have associated with the meaning first person singular, also present indicative, and things like that. Um, it's related to other word forms systematically in that you shares the same meaning and some of the same phonological material. The only thing that changes is the suffixes, and associated with them is a different meaning. 
Now, what you look at here is, this is how it's fundamentally different from a morphine-based view of morphology. Um, coal, for example, is not an allomorph, we would say, of O. Rather, there's this less regular paradigm that um, there's going to be verbs with some phonological material here that are going to end in skull, like this, that are also associated with the same stuff that ended in samos and se and sen. The S doesn't actually mean anything, right? This is just how the word forms fit together. So this would fit, you know, conosco, conocemos, conoce, conocen. And um, the way this kind of works is that um, if you think about it, if you actually look at a Spanish dictionary, at least the one I have, if you look up a new word and you need to know how do I conjugate this word, for example, estremecer, and I don't know what it means, but I know that it fits this paradigm, but I forget what it means, it will say uh, conjugate in the form of conocer, and then it will give you a heading and you go to the front and it gives you a whole paradigm for conocer, and this is essentially what that is trying to capture. This is a, it's about how to fill the cells of this paradigm without listing, you know, these are the suffixes. So you don't have to say, for example, that this K means something, or that Ko is a variant of Ko. All right. Okay. All right. Right now, formally, this isn't much of an improvement, I will admit, on um, item arrangement for all morphology. It kind of looks like a notational variant with a different uh, set of ideas behind it. But what about some difficult data? So, let's see. All right. Tundra Nenets. This is, a, this is the pet of... Uh, Feral Ackerman down at UCSD. If you talk to him for five minutes, he'll end up talking for six minutes about Tundra Nets. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's his crazy language and it's all this crazy stuff. It's great. It's from way up north, east somewhere. And um, it's got a bunch of different cases. It has uh, it's, yeah, seven different cases and three different numbers, singular, dual, and plural, and it conjugates broadly. So what we're going to have to follow is a list of nouns, nominative singular forms, and their accusative plural forms. And so we're going to play a game to see if we can predict what the next accusative plural form is going to be. So let's start out. We have these three. And these should look pretty unsurprising. In fact, totally uninteresting. This is kind of what English looks like. They're exactly the same. I'm not trying to trick you. So next one, next two, though, if you look, we have nguda, ngugi, pedara, pedargi. And what happens is this a becomes a yi. Next one. It's kind of the same thing, except it's like the A ah becomes an E if you want to get right down to it. And that's kind of different. And then the next one, well, that's just kind of totally different. The A ah becomes an O. And we have Hamba, and it just loses a piece of itself to become the accusative plural. The next two, the A ah becomes an U. Uh. Then we have, like, goose. That just looks like a great word there. Gusto, I think goose. That's more of a goosey word than goose. <laughs> <laughs> so you have yato, yatu, tudako, tudaku, right? And so that's a pattern at least. Then you have that's just terrible. I, I don't I have no explanation for that. No ho becomes no si. This one you kind of get like an o suffix. That's pretty cool. Um, here you get a yi suffix. This one and I don't have a gloss for it is you get a ye suffix. That's kind of similar. This one is wit and wingo, so the glottal stop becomes an ungo. Uh, this one, the glottal stop becomes a do. Uh, this, which I don't have a word for, you get a sie on the end of there, and this word, pada, becomes padro. They got glottal stops at the beginning of this language. So, uh, any, any predictions for ungano? <laughs> Oh, I love, I love hearing Carol pronounce it. Oh, 
It's too for the voice. So that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's an awesome language. All right, but anyway. So we can account for the genitive plural with just a simple relational rule. And what, ha what you have here, this x just says some form. It, and it can be any form that's associated with this lexical category and this meaning. And the meaning that it's associated with is accusative plural. It says whatever the accusative plural form is, add a glottal stop and you will get the genitive plural associated with the same noun. That is pretty cool. And um, the accusative plurals themselves can be accounted for with similar rules, but a whole bunch of different ones. But honestly, that's kind of what you have to learn. You have to learn what the noun classes of 10 minutes are in order to speak. You've got to know what's, what's what. And, um, okay, all right. An I account, on the other hand, would have to posit several different accusative plural morphemes. So, for example, uh, ooh and o, oh, among the others. As well as, here's the thing, nominative singular morphemes. So if you remember ya and yo, I think that was the word for land. If you accept that o is an accusative plural suffix, that means that a must be an accusative, uh, nominative singular suffix as well. And so you're going to have a bunch of o's, a's, and u's, which mean a whole bunch of different things, essentially. And um, also, the most important thing, we had a very simple rule, which just says take whatever form, whatever sound the accusative plural is, add a glottal stop, and you get the genitive plural. Under a morphing-based view, it would necessarily mean that the idea, the meaning of accusative plural was contained within the genitive plural. So essentially, you would have noun, accusative plural, genitive plural. But do you really want to say that? I don't. I would say no. Hesitantly, I would say no. In, a case, in some cases, you would also have the nominative singular in there as well. I'm thinking for han. So, go from han to hano to hano. Sorry, I'm terrible at this. All right. A WFP a relationship uh, simply notes the uh, relationship between inflected words. And um, so, it's not a problem that the accusative plural is used to construct the genitive plural. Because once you're getting a fully inflected form, all you have is a mean associated with it, plus some idea of how to actually create the phonological form. And it's also not a problem for which suffixes are added. So whether you get the ah, the o, oh, the ye, and so forth, because these words are stored in the lexicon in a paradigm. So you're already given what forms you're going to get. And then what you have is, say, if you hear a novel form, and this is what's helpful to like a learner of a language in theory, if you get a novel form, you're, you're able to kind of predict what class this is going to fall into. You'll get some confusion, but you're going to get better and better as you hear more and more forms and get better and better with the language. And this is kind of like what happens maybe when we learn a language. That's, that's the theory anyway, but there's a, a dearth of research on this. Anyway, so the question is, how can a WP framework help a conlanger create a naturalistic conlang that's more naturalistic? And so that's where we get to this section. All right, so now we have the old question, the same question we have to ask ourselves. What's the goal of a language creator? Now, word and paradigm's answer to this would be to create the parameters, and this is my funky definition, that define the various paradigms of a conline, and then to fill the resulting paradigms, not to create a list of morphemes. All right. So, first of all, I wanted to note there's something about a paradigm that mandates that the form of a given cell be composed of a stem so like, here's your word, here's the suffix, or the prefix. Cells can be filled by single word expressions, uh, suppletive or non-suppletive. So for example, go when that's a, that's a suppletive form. Or even multi-word expressions. For example, uh, those that are interested, <laughs> time for minutes for the dual paradigm uses two words to uh, derive its dual paradigm uh, for only the local cases. And then for the non-local cases, it has a single word. That's pretty weird. Anyway. All right, so um, I wanted to show some examples of how you might use this to do some conlang. So I was previously going to pronounce it scare, but now I'm going to pronounce it scare. So, um, <laughs> so this, is a, this is an example I got from Doug Ball. This is an absolutely gorgeous example. All right, um, so this is, this is a word that everybody needs in their conlang spine. Um, so what you have here is object markers. So like, let me just take the first cell there, uh, and we have seen that. Hey, hey, all right. Um, that means that these all have some sort of a past tense morphology on them. And um, what this cell means is that a general third person, unspecified, spies on me 
general third person's bias on you, on him, and so forth. And that's, and see, this up here is the infinitive form, and this is the transitive form. And uh, you can ask Doug for more information on that. It's an interesting story. All right, so if you just look at this paradigm, you can um, pretty much account for what you see like this. Here we go. So this really fits a morphine-based view right now. Here's spy, here's the infinitive prefix, here's the past prefix, and here are all the object suffixes. So, so far, so good, as far as morphine-based account goes. But consider the following. So here, the only difference is, now we have visitation, and notice that the previous one ended in a consonant, this one ends in a vowel. Right here, you have kind of the same set of suffixes, and if you want to look back at the previous one, this is why I included the slides on my <coughs> It's pretty much the same suffixes, only the difference is that the vowel isn't orthographic I, the vowel is now orthographic E, and Y, because the last vowel of the word is orthographic E. And in fact, um, all the vowel final words of uh, a sphere are going to work like this, you know, regardless of whether they're vowel or not. In fact, it could be, it could be orthographic I, or U, or O, or A, and they will all work the same way. Where now what you have, instead of the uh, orthographic I doing, the lengthening deal, now it's the orthographic E doing it. So, um, for an I account, the question is where are the morphemes? It would have to look something like this. You would have to have two different versions of the suffixes. One that attaches to consonant final stems and one that attaches to vowel final stems. And uh, so you have ina, na, and then ina, and then I suppose for the long vowels, you'd have to kind of treat length as a segment, which is somewhat problematic. And so you could say it's long, na. But, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me back up for one moment. I wanted to say about this, that's doing, there are two problems with this. One, if you posit allomorphy in this way, there's nothing about the suffixes themselves that looks like they belong together. So, for example, the, the C final one could have been Ina, the V final one could have been S. It could have been anything. It's, it just appears like an accident that they happen to look so darn similar. And so, um, a WP account can actually account for that not being accidental. So uh, this is kind of what that would look like. What you have on top, this is the general pattern. It says if you have a, if you have a, a verb of some kind, you want a first singular object, it will end in this, some sort of vowel, and this na, second singular, you know, long vowel. And how you get the vowel is going to be a subset of rule. Notice that this is a proper subset. This rule can actually fit into this rule. And that's, uh, as a part, that's a feature of WP that's, uh, that helps it out, I think. So this one says specifically, if you end in a consonant, you have uh, this E, epithetic orthographic I in there, that participates in this pattern. And um, so if you compare the two, for example, I, I don't want to get into symbol counting metric, but if you compare these two rules, this one is more complex than this rule. And it's exactly more complex in that you have to know that the value you're going to get here is i. And that should be more complex because there's no way to just know that. You have to know that the epithetic vowel is i and not some other vowel, and so that's why this rule is more complex than it should be. All right, so that's Doug Ball Scare. It's a really cool language. I recommend you go look at it right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, in words you might state the pattern as follows. To mark an object on a verb of scare, you add a suffix appropriate to the person and number of the object, you know, you know, blah, 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 blah. Additionally, the vowel preceding the second and third person suffixes will be long. For C final verb roots and epithetic E I is inserted. Notice this doesn't say really anything about what the suffixes are. That was kind of glossed over. It just said, you know, a suffix that's appropriate to purpose and the number. The focus is on how to fill the paradigm cells and where the things are going to be different. So, anyway. Yeah, so that, that was the first example, and I absolutely love that example. So um, here's a question. Ever notice how hard it is to emulate something like this in your conlates? So um, here are some English Latinate nouns, and they participate in these paradigms. So you have receive, reception, receptive, corrode, corrosion, corrosive, propose, proposition, proposive, doesn't really work so much, excite, excision, and excited, uh, that's pretty terrible. Respond, responsion, responsive, and obate, just terrible innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, good, obate it. Yeah, and actually obate is a word, if you look it up, it's uh, egg-shaped, so not really. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can imagine creating this on a fly. You may all obey now. <laughs> <laughs> and see, you got it. Wow. All right. 
So here's the thing. This just, for <laughs> this just looks like a mess. It looks like an absolute mess. How could English possibly do this? I mean, it's not even that, okay, some of these words are Latinate. No, they're all Latinate, and they're all like the same kind of Latinate suffixes. Why do some work and why do some not? Uh, previously, patterns like this have been accounted for either by ad hoc stipulations, for example, e.g., Latinate verbs that end in os don't take a pit, so you don't have to propose it. That's one way of counting it. Or via the blocking principle, which suggests that a, um, a similar word will block a derived word, it, except that it doesn't exactly work in these examples. So uh, we, we already had uh, drinkable as an example. Notice that he didn't use the word potable, but that means drinkable. It's just not very, it's not something that comes to the top of your head. So it's not like potable drop blocks drinkable, the existence of the two. They both mean the same thing, they're both derived and they're both there. So while you might think that excitement blocks excitation, it doesn't appear to be the case with potable and drinkable. Further, two can exist at the same time. So for example, the readable came up in somebody's talk. And so you could say, you know, this book is highly readable. I don't know, a book you enjoy. And I, mean, I would say The Great Gatsby is really readable. Now imagine if uh, somebody asked me, what do you think of uh, you know, uh, Hemingway's um, The Sun Also Rises? And I said, the book is legible. <laughs> So um, the blocking principle does not necessarily work so much. We, are, we want a better explanation. And um, an, alter an alternative might be to propose that uh, words participate in derivational paradigms as well as inflectional. And uh, here I want to make a whole bunch of qualifying statements because I just didn't want to change the slide by knowing one or more words in a derivational paradigm. One can tell which variants work and which don't. No. Um, but uh, what, uh, to an extent, that is what I mean, um, WP patterns can be used to relate groups of derived words in a systematic way. And I won't qualify it, or I won't go any more into detail than that. So um, here's an example with uh, sign language that I created. So this one's by me. Um, in in KNL, KNSL, this is how I call it, there's a regular pattern whereby nouns that refer to the object of a transitive verb can be derived simply by changing the handshape of the corresponding verb. And, uh, disclaimer, this is going to be transcribed in uh, the IPA for sign language that I invented it, so it probably won't look too familiar. All right, so, uh, so eyes up here. All right, you have this verb, cook. This is the, this is the um, e umlaut handshake. The thumb is inside and covered like this. And the verb, cook, looks like this. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, now, if you want to change it to the word meal, which is kind of resulted now and has to do with cook, you change it to the K handshake, which looks like this, and you make the same motion. All right, so cook, meal. Next one, uh, tie. This is, this is a favorite one of mine. Tie looks like that, same handshape, and you change both not. Let's see. This is sing. This is song. Uh, think looks like this. Hand frame, hand shake, facing sideways, sorry. Looks like this, and thought looks like this. Uh, smell looks like um, this, and then scent or odor looks like that. Um, and then so we have eat, which looks like this. And then what would you predict that this would be? Any ideas? Food would be the obvious choice, but it's the wrong choice. It actually means fork. <laughs> and um, the word for food looks like this. T handshape, uh, thumb between the first and second finger, and this is food. All right, so that's kind of a, a blocking principle effect, but there's more to the story here. So um, a separate multi-word expression is used to derive instruments from verbs, regardless of transitivity. And so what this is doing is a multi-word expression. You have the first word, and then the second word is up here, and it looks like this, and it actually means thing. In fact, both of these come from the same word, thing, just one I borrowed the handshake, and the other one I used a multi-word expression. So a cook thing is the instrument used to cook, that's like a stove. A sing thing is a microphone. A, a see thing is glasses. And so how about an eat thing? Maybe a fork or a utensil? Actually, it doesn't mean anything at all. It would, the idea is that, or it doesn't mean anything right now, if somebody were to say it, it would either be interpreted literally or somehow metaphorically in the context. And so, um, the way that I wanted to capture these facts is, let's see what I'm looking at here. 
All right. Oh gosh, these rules are so hard to understand. No, 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 I'm kidding, they're very easy. Okay, so the first one what you have is this is your general object rule. So you have a verb here, which is a transitive verb that has this hand shape, and it's associated with a noun that kind of means the object or result of that, and all it does is it changes the hand shape associated with whatever sign it is. And that's the symbol for hand shape. The hand shape occurs in the uh, brackets right at the beginning. All right, the next, para the next paradigm shows you a three-way paradigm. It shows you, uh, you have a transitive verb, so some transitive verb that means Z. You have the instrument of the transitive verb, which actually uses this object paradigm. The reason it gets the interpretation instrument is because there's a separate existing word Y, which could be anything, which already means the object. This is kind of a way to emulate a partial blocking effect. And then, with the, uh, with the, with the next set, if you have, you know, just any, any verb, doesn't matter what kind of transitivity it is, means instrument by adding this other word, then you have uh, the regular pattern where you get the transitive verb, the object by changing the hand shape, and then the instrument by adding the word. And um, if you have this paradigm, or some sort of paradigm, this is how you can fill the three out, and uh, the previous one, this is how you can fill those three out. If you already have instrument and object in there, there's no part of this paradigm that allows for a systematic interpretation of the uh, regular rule that derives instruments, uh, number three up there. Because there's no way to systematically interpret that rule, because all the uh, systematic interpretations are locked, then it can either be given to an idiomatic or, or perhaps a literal interpretation, probably a little literal interpretation. In derivation, things aren't that hard fixed. But at least um, with lexical relatedness morphology, you can play with both at the same time. All right, so uh, for the last example, another thing that uh, natural languages do, as shown with tender minutes in its accusative plural and gender plural, we're getting there, is uh, reuse useful forms. So for example, these are two irregular verbs of English. The usual is where you have three different forms, write, wrote, and written. They're all related, but they're all different. For break, broke, and broken, it kind of looks like Broke, or broken, is a combination of broke plus in. Under a morphing-based view, you might have to say that if broke equals past tense, in equals past participle, or maybe just participle, and then you combine the two to get something like that. And so what, what's, what's happening here is that broke is kind of a useful form, and it's just being used to create another, another cell in the paradigm. So this is another example by me, and I apologize for this. I really was looking for this conling that had exactly the example that I wanted that kind of looked like Estonian. I could have used Estonian. Maybe I should have. But I wanted these all to be uh, conlings for some reason. I think, it, I think it was the nature of the conlings. Anyway, so um, the waiter in this language has a healthy number of noun cases. And some of these, <laughs> these you know, yeah, it's, I think it's got like 12 or something. It's, it's, like, it's like an Estonian number of noun cases. That, Simple side note, there is a language out there with over 200 noun cases. Natural language. What? Says? I think it says. Is this right? That's how it is. Yeah, okay. So, people that, you know, come up with like, you know, oh, my language has 57 cases, I don't know anybody who has a language like that. Maybe it's not so bad. All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, so here's a, here's a partial paradigm for, do. Regular, for regular noun. This is, this is not, this is unproblematic for a morphing-based account. This is nut. And in the nominative and instrumental singular and plural, um, the first cell you see like a stem. This one has a suffix ex. This one has an instrumental prefix ta. And then this one has both the prefix and the suffix to fill, fill you out with the cell. That looks pretty regular and pretty well behaved. Um, now here's a partial paradigm for one class of irregular nouns. Um, is the last one not italicized? Oh well. Anyway, so in this one, what you have is phi, and it changes to phi. If I'm pronouncing that right. I and um, this is what tells you that you've gone from the nominative singular to the nominative plural. So there's no suffix on there. It's just a, an a, a umlaut change. And then in the second, all you do is add the prefix. There's some vowel harmony going on there which you can ignore. The prefix is the same. So under this account, once you can account for the vowel change that is associated from singular to plural, you can kind of take care of this and say, this is plural, and then you just add your suffix as usual. Then you have this third irregular class, which becomes more problematic. The nominative looks the same, uh, umlaut going from singular to plural, count to can, but then in the instrumental, notice you're using that nominative plural form, 
And so you get tag hand, yes? Oh, oh, cool. All right. Really? Okay, okay. All right. So then you have tag hand, and then you have in the plural tag camis, which looks like double marking. First, you have the instrumental prefix. Then you have this this umlaut chain, which, which we thought was associated with plurality. Then you have the plural suffix on there, so it's like this word is super plural and also instrumental. And um, in WP, there's just a few uh, patterns to say, and the con layer only needs to decide which nouns are going to fall into which classes. And this is what this is. I want to show you exactly how I did this, how I used these principles. So. Um, First, I'll show you the overarching generalizations, which are simple, and then the individual classes. So this is when I was creating, sitting there, like creating affixes and so forth. This was all I did. I just thought, okay, there's going to be some sort of an umlaut process. It's a bit bigger than this. And it'll be like taking a noun from the singular to the plural. And there's also going to be like a plural suffix or something that looks like that. And then there's going to be an instrumental prefix. And that was it. After that point, that's when what happened was all I did was work with the patterns. So this is the regular pattern. All you do is you add your plural suffix, you add your instrumental prefix, and so, for example, um, notice that that's just a nominative to instrumental. So this X could be a plural noun. It doesn't matter. So that, that does the whole thing for the regulars. Next, we have this um, umlaut, which can be taken care of um, in this way. So this means part of the word, this means the rest of the word, and it says this has this vowel associated with it, and it changes to that vowel. It's more complex and can be more complex than the lexical relatedness morphology and blah, 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 blah. But that's, that's fine for now. And you see the same case rule. And here is the last class where you have the same kind of pluralization rule. Now it refers specifically to nominative singular and nominative plural. And this is how you derive the rest of the cells. And it uses the nominative plural as a base. And then what I did for the rest of the language is that thank you, there are um, I don't know, there are like 12 cases or something, maybe 16, I don't know. And that uh, all the, uh, if you notice that there was the nominatives did one thing and the instrumentals did the other thing, there's uh, the core cases do everything that the nominative cases, cases do, and every, all the lo local cases do what the instrumental do. And so rather than deciding, you know, rather than deciding my regularity was going to be different types of suffixes and prefixes, I came up with kind of an invariant set of suffixes and prefixes and then just split them around in different patterns. And that was how I uh, created um, principal irregularity. That's kind of the goal. By using a WP style framework, it's easier, and it's kind of uh, built into it to be able to create a systematic and principal irregularity. There's always going to be words in the language that are just you know one-offs, like child, children. There's nothing else that fits that paradigm. But by and large, in natural languages, a lot of irregularity is rather principled, and things fit into patterns in families. So, write, wrote, uh, gosh, I can't think of another one. Drive, drive, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> uh, first thing I thought was bike, boat. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I pretty much stated this. The difference between uh, classes and knowledge affixes are used, which case pattern is used. Uh, summary, so I introduced the general INWP models I suggested that a WP model like Bachner's might be more suitable for analyzing natural languages than a morphine-based model, but I don't want to argue that, okay? Uh, I, I got people that can argue that, but not me, all right. In terms of creating a naturalistic conline, it's been suggested that the goal is not to create a list of morphemes, but rather instead, uh, the work is creating um, paradigms, essentially, the parameters of such a language, and um, then the paradigms, and then to fill them. And the result is that, this is kind of the interesting part, the affixes themselves are not morphologically interesting. They're definitely phonologically interesting in how they interact with words they attach to, but they're not morphologically interesting. Instead, patterns of relatedness between word forms within paradigms is where all the actions have. And this is how, this is some further reading you can do with my WP plus Spencer. Thank you. I actually rushed you a little bit um, intentionally, so we'd have uh, time for questions. We've got seven minutes left on the table. So, uh, anyone have a couple of questions? Pretty sure somebody does. I have, I have a comment. Yeah. It, it seems that natural languages would have both the paradigms and the morphemes. Like in English, you could say um, a, a boat right. So I guess, sorry, what? Like a boat right or a shipwright? That's what I'm looking for. Shipwright? 
ship right. Big ships. A ship what? Right. right. Uh, like a boat swing? <laughs> <laughs> you guys in one nautical vocabulary. <laughs> I think we have time for one more short question. We've got three okay. minutes. So. Um, yeah, this is just a short comment. Um, the way the WP works, it seems like the rewriting rules in computer science, just the layered rewriting rules. And I think that's, uh, I guess, computationally a good way to approach it. Um, I think it fits very well with computer science in the sense that's how you one would go about studying it. Yeah, okay. you, the morphine way seems to be more of the, um, the old one pass parser type thing, whereas the WP is sort of the rewriting rules, which is you can't do one pass, but it is more sophisticated. And the cool thing is that those people talk now. We were some computational scientists that were they talk. Which is awesome. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, perhaps one more, I'm, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering how, oh, 
was wondering how uh, WP uh, works with uh, poly gods. Uh, how it works with uh, polysynthetic languages. Do you just end up with yeah, it's huge a paradigms of doom. Well, the, the idea is that, um, that there's, a, there's a kind of, uh, you know, people repel at the idea, oh my god, there are all these paradigms. Oh, this is horrible. Because of this old idea that I didn't want to get to about the symbol counting metric, which was that uh, it, it used to be literally that the less ink used for the rule, like printer ink, then the better the rule, if it does the same thing. Um, the idea with word and paradigm morphology is that we're not counting symbols, rather we're, we're counting redundant information. So for example, for a gigantic polysynthetic word, yes, it's a gigantic paradigm, but there's a lot of redundant information in there. So really, you only have to store that once. So even though, say, for example, you know, in Spanish, in a Spanish uh, verbal paradigm, you may have coso, and cose, and cosen, and maybe vivo, uh, vive, vive, and like that, you, and you have those stored in memory, it's not like it adds anything to tax your memory each time you add one of these suffixes, because you already have them down. And so for a polysynthetic language, it, the idea is that you kind of you get the forms once and they would be in there, but it shouldn't actually add to your memory. <coughs> I, I I wish I could explain that better. It's almost like, like applying mentally applying a template over and over again. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you just from those you draw generalizations. Okay. I think we'll have to leave it out there for now. All right.